Good. So today's topic is refuge. And refuge is really the most basic topic in many ways in all of Buddhism. Arguably, there are other ones before it. In the official outline, it comes very much in the beginning. So after talking about the greatness of the lineage and the doctrine, um, about the spiritual friend, which is also basically what is a guru, um, precious human rebirth, and then death and suffering. So death and suffering, in a way, we had some of that in the last class on the bardo, is supposed to get you scared so that you're inspired to go for refuge. And refuge, I thought that maybe first we should talk about what the word really means, you know, a refuge is a place where you flee for safety, right? So for instance, to illustrate like in this kind of an area, uh, we are close to the coast and before they had the dike systems, very reg regularly, not necessarily once a winter, but almost every winter there would be a storm flood where everything would got washed over by the raging seas and they built the churches in the highest places where the water would reach last so people could flee there and take refuge when the storm flood will come. So that's the idea of a refuge, an outer refuge in the world, right? It's where you can run for safety when it gets dangerous. That's a refuge. So it's a little bit also like the word Anchorage, <clears throat> like the city of Anchorage in Alaska. That was the safe haven in the Arctic Sea where you could bring your ship for safety from, you know, icebergs and all of those things. So we say that um, there's animal refuges where an animal that's out in the street and it will die from lack of food, safety, or, you know, other reasons will be brought to the animal refuge, the place of safety where it will be protected. So it's really this idea of, and I think the English word is very well taken, this idea um, that it's a place where you go for safety and where you will be protected. And that's very important to talk about the meaning of this word so we understand what taking refuge really means. Now, of course, that is the English word, and um, that's not the meaning of the Tibetan, and I do not know the Sanskrit of it, so I don't know what the Sanskrit for this would be, but the... Um, the Tibetan word is kyapsuchi, and kyap means cover. So um, it's really very old, antique, ancient Tibetan. So, but in modern Tibetan, it still means to cover. Like, you know, I go to bed and I pull up the cover and I'm covering myself. It's that word. And so in a sense, you could... I mean, it of course means something different in English language, but you could say it's like run for cover, right? Um, if you run for cover, again, you, there's a dangerous situation, usually a shooting, and you run, so something covers you like a screen that that's protecting you, right? So in that sense, um, we can make it clear a little bit to us in English, what refuge is supposed to mean. And um, I have, I feel, I have felt over time that um, 
there is not a really good and deep understanding of what it means to take refuge in the western amongst the western buddhists because we have an idea of being baptized you know or like the jewish you know you have bar mitzvah so it's like the idea is like um there's something that happens on the outside and now you're the member of a religious community right you're a baby you're born somebody sprinkles this water on your forehead and now you're a christian right so um and mm -hmm. That's really not what the Buddhist meaning of refuge is. And I think it, it, it's worse for us because we're Western Buddhists because it's so external and mechanical. So I'll give you something from Christianity now to understand how, how different Buddhism is. So um, for instance, in the olden days, I don't know that this still plays out at all, um, or not, midwives had the right to give emergency baptism because a baby that wasn't baptized could not be buried in the graveyard because the graveyard was defined as Christian territory. If you were not a Christian, you couldn't be buried there, which, I mean, I think it's completely idiotic, but that's how it was. So the midwife at birth could give an emergency baptism. So the dead body of a baby that died in the birth process, or, you know, could be a Christian dead body and be buried in the graveyard. I mean, that's how external and materialistic it was. And I remember as a child thinking like, why would God have something against a baby that died at birth and say like your dead body can't be in my graveyard i mean this never made any sense to me but it was that mechanical and we come from that kind of a culture um so in buddhism as far as i understand there was no refuge ceremony now there is a refuge ceremony. It was invented for Westerners. The idea was that whether or not you're a Buddhist is something in your heart and in your mind. It's something on the inside. And then, you know, the 60s rolled along with the hippies and they went to India and wanted to take refuge. And then they came up with an external ceremony that you can say is parallel to becoming uh, baptized as a Christian. And even then, a lot of people take refuge um, because it's fun to take part in an ethnographic ritual of sorts right it's like i've had people say to me like oh it sounds so cool there's refuge tonight uh shouldn't can, can i take refuge i'm like you, you know you're supposed to take refuge because you've decided you want to be a buddhist for the rest of your life oh i thought it sounded cool um i mean this is also a weird um approach because you don't say like oh it sounds so cool to get baptized let me just get baptized today i'll think about whether or not i want to be a catholic some other time you know it's it's mm -hmm. a very strange um relationship that westerners have to the concept of taking refuge in the olden days in india refuge meant that you have done philosophical contemplations and considerations that have led you to the point where you believe that this is the philosophy and the spiritual practice that will save your mind, right? That will make sure your mind is safe, like in the anchorage, like in a refuge, in a shelter, that that's where you run for cover, that if somebody holds a gun up to your head and is about to shoot you, that you will run for cover to Buddhism in your mind. That's what it means, right? 
And um, that is why refuge is basically the first step. It's also the foundation for any other practice. The first thing you do in any other further practice is you take refuge. Like any prayer, any practice starts with taking refuge. It's And it's not going to a shelter. There's nothing on the outside. Taking refuge is flipping your mind in a state of mind where you understand what is going to save you from what? From suffering, right? That you flip your mind from saying, I will not do things that will bring me suffering. I'll do things that will bring me peace of mind and happiness. So if you're standing there and it's like, should I steal or should I not steal? That you say, oops, um, I go for refuge to not stealing because that will give me good karma. Unless, of course, you're stealing food for a homeless person who's about to starve, then it's actually an act of saving life, not of stealing. You know, or it becomes one of those interesting mixed karma events. So... It is also really, really interesting to think about what taking refuge means when you allow yourself the metaphor of a refugee to say, I take refuge. That means I am a refugee. I'm running away from a place of suffering and where I'm not safe. Where is that place? That place is samsara. It's my ordinary life where I'm wasting my good karma, where I'm doing bad deeds, where I'm being mindless, where I'm doing nothing to prepare for the process of death, for the bardo, for a good rebirth, which is so dangerous because whatsoever could happen to me, I'm running away from that dangerous place. I'm a refugee in a caravan with other Buddhists trying to go for refuge, to knock on the door to enlightenment and say, please let me in. Let me practice here. Let me make my mind better. Let me accumulate good karma so I'm protected from harm. My mind is protected for, from harm. In Buddhism, almost everything is always about your mind, not about, because it very much is not interested in present circumstances, wealth, and all of those things. Uh, the outer life is not so important, right? And so when we are saying like, Kyapsu Chiu, like I'm running for cover, it's like, well, the question is, what am I running from and where am I running towards, right? So what am I running from? Well, um, are you looking at some of you, it's like, I'm running away from New York City. You know, it's like everything that's worldly. So this is, of course, a very um, gross exaggeration because you can be very spiritual in New York City. But, you know, there's like the big apple, the temptation, the... Um, indulging the best food and entertainment and Broadway and distraction and all of those things. I'm running away from that. And I'm running towards virtue. So also when you're taking these kind of rituals, like the ritual leader will ask you, who are you? Right. And you will answer I'm a beggar of virtue. So I'm a beggar. Why am I so poor? I don't have good karma. I don't have virtue because I didn't practice virtuous deeds. So you're knocking on the door of the refuge saying, I'm a virtue beggar. Please let me in so I can be vir virtuous and build up my good karma, become a good person in the sense of having good karma and doing good deeds. So I'm safe from the ocean of, of samsara means samsara is the worldly world right for those of you who are not buddhists um temptation and all of those things so 
basically by taking refuge, if you take refuge in a truly Buddhist sense, um, you're doing what the Christ said when he said, I'm in this world, but not of it. You're basically saying for the rest of this life and all future lives, I want to run away from this world and not be in it. That is the metaphor of the lotus flower that grows in the mud. You know, it grows in the mud. That's the worldly world with its temptations. And from there manages to grow up and produces amazing blossom, right? Um, so I take refuge from this world and in this world, I'll forever have refuge statues, I'll, statue, I'll never belong. There is no place in this world in reality that I can ever call my home or feel at home and comfy in because the moment I feel comfortable, that means I'm not practicing right. I missed some point because everything in this reality is um I'm lacking the English word right now because I'm speaking too many languages. Um you know, false in the sense of like a false appearance that um suggests something that it's not. Does anybody here speak good French? No. Um so it's like Maybe I can say it's like a Fata Morgana or it's like an apparition that like a mirage. Yeah, but when it suggests something that is um, nicer than it is in reality, right? So, um, so that this is like some kind of weird hallucination, this world suggesting something that's not really there suggesting safety that's not there like especially our kind of affluent society constantly saying take out this insurance buy a house own a couch uh, do this that and the other and you'll be so safe yeah and at the end you're gonna die and then you're in the bardo and then what you know it's like you're gonna lose everything all of it there is no safety it's it's fake it's it's a trick it's tricking you into believing that you can secure yourself when it will all just bottom out from underneath you again that's the teachings of uh, impermanence in in buddhism right like it will not last it will not last and so actually being is very good if in this life you're a refugee, life is doing you a favor because it's kind of revealing to you the reality of this existence in a Buddhist sense. Meaning it's shit and I don't belong and nothing is safe. The only thing I can do is go for refuge to my own mind, to the good things it can do and do good good deeds and good practice that's the only thing i can do so whenever we feel freaked out by this life and really lost and like we're screaming for help these are the best moments to really understand refuge and the practice of taking refuge because we feel like a refugee and we can also see that, you know, there's always a story of like the person saying, you know, God, where were you when I really needed you? Right. So it's like in Buddhism, we don't expect God to show up and help us. Right. We understand that in the end, we are alone. And the only thing we can do to help us is do the right thing in our own mind to make ourselves feel safe. So 
Um, I once read a really nice article a very long time ago called Safety is an Inside Job. It was about meditation practice, you know, so the safety of the refuge pack practice is an inside job. You do it in your own mind. You do something in your own mind that makes you feel safe. If you truly go for refuge, um, even in the moment when your life is at danger, you can make yourself feel safe. And I'm not just saying that as a joke. Um, it so happened once upon a time, I happened to be in London, and this is not a joke. I had to get off at the subway station in Leytonstone, home to Hitchcock, where the entire subway station is um, decorated with mosaics of his horror movies. And as I got off the train, there was a state strange stir in the masses of people and I didn't understand what's going on until I almost stepped in a puddle of blood this size because somebody had been stabbed and it was lying on the floor bleeding and then because there were already people standing around who had obviously called the ambulance I thought well I'll just keep going so I walked through the turnstiles and I mean, this can only happen in Britain that nobody said something to me in front of me were two women with two little girls. Nobody said anything to us. And next thing, the guy with the knife came back and ran towards us and was screaming, this is for Syria. This is just when England had decided to bomb Syria a couple of years ago, you know, and we had to run for cover behind. I mean, there was a little corner this size behind a wall that was the only cover we could run for and I started doing refuge and praying in my mind because it's the only thing you can do when I actually didn't know that in Britain at the time thank God um, it was extremely difficult to own a gun if that scene had happened in the United States he would have pulled out a machine gun and mowed us all dead you know, so I thought I'm I, I'm like, I'm dead. I better go for refuge and do the things to take care of my mind. And subsequently, I also stopped feeling feeling freaked out. I It's like I entered into a completely different state of mind. I entered into a state of practice, which is like a parallel reality. And I think Sam, you'll understand that very well, because when you're a performing artist, you have to create that fake alternative reality the moment you go on stage. You can't stay who you are in the state in which you are, because that's nobody wants to watch that, right? So you create something else. And that's very much what you're doing as a spiritual practitioner. And also when you take refuge, it's like you unplug yourself from this ordinary conventional reality appearance and you plug yourself into a higher alternative universe, you know? So now I've talked about that before that, you know, um, astrophysicists and quantum theorists, all they talk about multiple universes and the multiverse and all of that. So it's not even foo-foo stuff to talk about an alternative reality. You know, it's like, that's what the scientists talk about. So, but you just have to do it. You have to switch. It's it's like going into a different gear in your mind, right? You have to switch gears. Maybe it's like when you're on the runway and you know, I don't know exactly what the pilot does, but suddenly it's like, take off, you know? So it's like, you have to do that with your mind. Otherwise you're just going to sit there and go like, I'm a Buddhist. Everything sucks. You know, it's like, well, okay, then why don't you start practicing? So um, so that is the whole idea of refuge is we are refugees from samsara towards enlightenment. We're knocking on the gates of enlightenment. And... and Obviously, we talked last time about the bardo, right? The bardo is 
it's also a state between, you know, so you have to again go between these states of mind. So in Buddhism, you're really training to shift states of consciousness and there are always these gaps in between, not just between a life in this body and a life in the energy body and the next physical body. So even here, you have to bridge a gap. You'll be going through a pardo, a small one within lives to then come out in a state where you're like, I feel safe. And I'll give you another uh, story. So when I lived in Dharamsala, um, it's really high up in the Himalayas. We are at, we are at 1,800 meters divided by three. That's six, right? So that, no, no, times three. Whatever, three times that in feet. So it's high. And it's like every next hill would be 3,000 feet higher than the one before. So behind us was 3,000 feet higher than that. And there were like um, leopards and other beasts there. I, I only saw leopards. I never saw um, a bear. But I heard a story that a woman walked in the um, mountains behind the mountain we were on and um apparently bumped into a bear and the bear went Row! and like wanted to like devour her head and in that moment she took in a refuge and she just invoked the image of the Dalai Lama very clearly well she came down from the mountain saying that the moment she did that the bear just let go of her so those are the stories of what happens when you shift reality with by whatever it is on the inside that you're doing. So I'm not going to say that that's the reason, but that guy who was jumping around with a knife wanting to kill us all because of Syria. So I went, start to go for refuge and recite protective mantras for everybody in the station because we were like a thousand people or something like that. And he just turned around and walked out. You know, he didn't stab another person. There were actually other people also stabbed already, but I hadn't seen them. Never mind. So this is what you do. You you just shift reality to a different reality. You shift gears. That's true taking refuge. And if that sounds too complicated, then maybe become a Christian. There you don't have to do work. Somebody puts water on your head and somehow that did it. So I'm not being sarcastic. I mean, I'm born and raised a Christian where you don't have to do any work at all. And then I came to the U.S. It's even easier there. Everybody assumes because they're Catholic, they'll automatically go to heaven. I mean, I was born and raised Protestant. We don't think it's that easy. So we think that at least you have to be a good person to go to heaven. But then in America, bigger and better, you know, just... Um, get some water on my forehead and I'll go to paradise. It's like very cool. So in Buddhism, bad news, you are supposed to work for it. You know, you want a good result, you got to work, work for it. That's what you're signing up. So I always say the big difference between being a Christian and a Buddhist is that as a Christian, you're God's child. So you can be like, daddy, I want chocolate, you know? So because God is your father, right? And you're the child. In Buddhism, you're a grown-up. It's like you're responsible for making your own income and your budget and your, your savings and your expenses, you know? It's like nobody's going to do it for you. can't say like, oh, guru, please give me another hundred bucks. I mean, nobody prays like that because it's ridiculous because as a, as a Buddhist, you're a grown-up and you're responsible for creating the life you want. And there's blessings and there is help, but not in the way we are led to believe in Christianity. And if that works or not, that even for the Christians, I'm not so sure. So, um, and I think that maybe because of that degenerate understanding of Christianity that also not in America, but here, like nobody goes and practices anymore. So, um, 
So again, it's like what I'm trying to say is like when you take a true taking refuge in Buddhism, it means you detach from samsara, from this world. And now there is a formula that we are given in the form of a prayer of what you're going to refuge for, right? And there is the, the three-part one and the four-part one. So the three-part one is you go to, to refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. That's the Sanskrit formula that's usually um, adhered to for English-speaking people. So the Buddha, according to we are here in Tibetan Buddhism, which is the higher form of Buddhism. That's not the historical Prince Siddhartha who became Shakyamuni Buddha as an enlightened yogi. Not that one. I always like to understand it in English as the principle, right? The thought form, the archetype, the um, underlying reality, the generalized meaning of Buddha. And Buddha means someone with an enlightened mind. So, and I need you to understand that neither in Tibetan nor in Sanskrit do we have pronouns. So you can neither say, neither in Sanskrit nor in Tibetan, can you say a Buddha or the Buddha? And most of the time in Tibetan language, it's not specified whether it's singular or plural. So you will be saying, I go to refuge to Buddha, and it can mean one, many, all of them, the Buddha or a Buddha or all Buddhas or any of that. It, it's so that, that that's also why I feel that the, the, the weak, get a better meaning of it if we, we think of it as um, someone who is a Buddha or any enlightened being or almost like Buddhahood, although that's also not correct. Because if we say, I go for refuge to Buddhahood, it, it sounds like I want to reach it. So here's like, I go to refuge to all of those who have actualized enlightenment in their own minds. And then sometimes the people will even say to the enlightened mind, like there's a cosmic pervading energy of that. And so when, I mean, we'll be talking about what it really means, the refuge practice in Buddhism. But what I like to do is, um, while I'm doing the practice, meditate on in the sense of um, analytic or reflection or contemplation meditation, these different aspects, and really think about them and feel them, what the meaning is, and really let it sink in, thinking that's what I'm going to refuge for, means... I want, it's kind of a sensation of like, I want to move towards it, into it, to become that, to reach it, to merge with it, right? So then the next thing is, I go for refuge to Buddha. The next one is Dharma. Dharma means that... Um, which I hold. So tar in Sanskrit means to hold. It means really the doctrine. Um, it really means doctrine sounds like, well, somebody wrote a bunch of rules and I have to stick to them. Tar means more like that which you can hold onto or grasp onto because it's truth. So I like to think of it as the truth, ultimate truth, you know? truth beyond what some human being thinks like the politicians that's not truth so it's ultimate ultimate truth and um 
even in in the Buddhist sense, it's it is the Buddhist doctrine, what Buddhism says that truth is. But within Buddhism, they have a paradigm that they say, if anybody can prove that what we are saying, our truth is, we have to drop that and change. Right? So, so like the Dalai Lama and all the great lamas accept everything natural science says and quantum physicists and so on and so forth because they say it's scientifically proven. So it is a form of truth and we must accept it because it's provable. So how can you then say it's not true, right? And and I've taught classes about also how actually whatever they say in the in their mystic tenets, what they're saying and quantum physics and the most advanced force forms of astrophysics, um, uh, physicists, whatever they are saying that it's actually the same, which is very cool. So, but so dharma here is doesn't mean some kind of narrow-minded human laws that have been put forwards, but like really ultimate truths. So for me, like I like to mostly think about it as saying I'm going for refuge to ultimate truth. And then um, in a very outer way, like I go for refuge to the Buddha means outer enlightened people. So then it's of course the question, how many enlightened people do you know? And then on the outer level, I go for refuge to the Dharma means, you know, I go to teaching events, I read Dharma books, you know, I walk around a stupa, you know, things like that. And um, then I go for refuge to the Sangha. Sangha is the community of Buddhist practitioners. So um, in German, we have this expression Gemeinschaft der Heiligen, which means um, the community of the saints. Um, don't you have some church that's like the saints of the latter day or whatever, you know? So there's also something in English, this idea. So it's, it's I mean, saints is made be over the top but it's the idea of saying like well if I'm trying to not do bad karmic deeds and good karmic deeds it's helpful to be surrounded by people who practice in a similar way it makes it a lot more easy you know because they will understand what I'm trying to do and if it's good dharma practitioners then they push each other higher. They make each other better. That's not necessarily the, the case, which is why it's actually one of the breaking, one of the, the good vows is because, of course, you can imagine like then there are these Buddhist centers and everybody starts fighting. And that wasn't the point, you know. So, um, so there's a vow against that. You're not supposed to get into bad fights with other practitioners because it's not good it's it, it's exactly i mean we see it play out very very publicly right now with all these church scandals and all the abuse um of power all the sexual exploitation that's been happening and um that is very parallel in the Bud so don't be naive it's very parallel in the buddhist centers and the scandals are breaking more and more and there'll be a lot more coming be as people, as Western practitioners stop being so naive. Um, there was, uh, somebody just asked me yesterday, did I see this documentary? It's about a year or one and a half years ago. It um, uh was broadcast in Europe in English, German, and French about terrible, terrible um, 
exploitation in Buddhist centers in France. It was called the law of silence means it's like, um, don't talk about it, you know, shut up about what really happens. And I mean, I didn't know the degree and the vastness of the sexual abuse and the financial extortion under Sogya Rinpoche at his center there. But what really, really, I mean, made me so sick that I just wanted to die and not be a Buddhist anymore for a couple of days was that there was also one center where systematically for a long time, the Western self-proclaimed guru made his students hand over their children into some kind of boarding school where they were mistreated, beaten, the girls sexually abused and starved. And I'm like, what? I mean, so refuge in the Sangha doesn't mean you start to believe that it's all right to starve children. You know, it's like, sorry, but no, this was not the point. So, um, I'm saying this, you know, it's like I just talked to a very, very dear, very old Dharma sister of mine yesterday. And I said to her, like, um, I'm really happy I'm teaching these classes because I say whatever I feel like saying. This is obviously not the doctrine, but I'm done because it's not serving us. We have to stop being naive, you know, and we all know we have this great thing called sociology. You, you know, it's like we know from sociolo sociology that whenever you have hierarchies of power, abuse explodes because it can be justified in the tiers of hierarchy and of hierarchical power. And it doesn't make a difference if suddenly a hierarchy of power called Buddhism or Buddhist organization, it makes no difference. So stop being naive and don't take refuge to that and don't turn a blind eye. This is not what the Buddha meant when he said take refuge to the Sangha. If there's something like that happening, then that's terrible and it's not Buddhism and don't take refuge to that. Don't carry it along. Don't, don't perp uh, perpetrate it, right? So what you're taking refuge to is true Sangha true Buddha, true Dharma, true Sangha, ultimate Sangha. So there's always in the, this refuge formula, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. There's two aspects, which is outer, conventional, and ultimate. Ultimate, for those of you who are advanced Buddhists, that's like, the um the emptiness aspect of it right where it's empty of inherent existence so but even the conventional should be pure it shouldn't be fake or pretend or just because somebody uses that word i am sangha it's like no 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 um Within a different context, there's there's ordained sangha and lay sangha. So in some contexts, it's ordained people. So the monks and nuns, they are the sangha, and the other people are not. But that's not true. If you've truly taken refuge in your heart and you're a real practitioner, then you're the so-called lay sangha, right? So that's important to understand. So this is when life gets nasty and shoots at you. That's where you're running for cover. Like mommy, mommy to the enlightened mind, the truth to ultimate truth. And those outer people around you who embody true spiritual values. So that's taking refuge. And 
The other refuge formula, the fourfold one, starts with um, I go for refuge to the to Guru, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And the reason why Guru can come first is because a true Guru, one who's not fake, is the embodiment embodiment of these three qualities as a living human being in the here and now. So a true guru, like say the Dalai Lama, embodies being enlightened, embodies true knowledge of the Dharma, ultimate truth, and also true insight and true being behavior living his life according to ultimate truth and he therefore is a sangha somebody who is your community of practitioners and you can rely on now we'll have is that next time or the time after next that we'll talk about guru devotion there are a lot of misunderstandings about that too and I want to advertise that class um, because Guru devotion is a concept that comes deep from within um, Indian culture. And maybe it being transplanted into the West didn't work so well and um, gave rise to a lot of mishaps and pitfalls and abuse again. And also went over so badly that the Dalai Lama, um, maybe already about two decades ago, started to say that it should no longer be taught as the entrance topic to Buddhism because it was really um, causing too much damage. So I will be talking about that. And um, yes, that's my advertisement speech for that class. So um, these are the these are the refuge formulas. That's how it's called. It's really like a like a prayer or a mantra you're reciting, and you re can recite it on your mala, which is your Buddhist rosary. You know, um, like a hail Mary, and people have different preferences. So I know some people who like to do it in Sanskrit, others in Tibetan, others in English. Um, then there's a lot of opinions about it. You know, it's like, oh, Sanskrit is the holy language and it's the original one. Oh, Tibetan is the language of my lineage and of my guru and my guru said it's superior to English and then other people say oh the thing that's most effective for the mind is the language you understand English is my language so I'm going to do it in English or whatever your native language is my personal opinion is that all of these things that I just said are correct and you will be happiest if you choose the one that suits you the best. It's like, pick your favorite ice cream. Why? Because you're the one who has to practice it. And if you don't like it and therefore you don't enjoy it and you won't do it a lot, then what good is it? You might as well pick, pick the one you like the best, that inspires you the most, so you do it more often, deeper, with greater enjoyment and better result. And you can even switch, you know. You can try around whatever is most, for me it's always like whatever is most effective for your mind in that moment. You know, it's not... I want to say something else. We're now starting this whole topic of repeating things over and over again, right? Um, you're not a 
what are these things called? In the olden days, they had these round things with little teeth sticking out, and you could go like this, and the music would come out. What's that called in English? You know, they, they had like little ones and big ones, and the man would come down the street, and people would throw pennies in his head. Anyhow, so we're human beings. Your soul isn't one of those like... Oh, money, pet me, more money, pet me, more money, pet me, more money, pet me. Mom. You're not a mechanical device, you know? So, the point of reciting anything over and over again is to, for it to seep. It, it's like, why do you have the lawn sprinkler on for one hour? You know, not because you want the thing to go to and fro. It's because you want the water to gently seep deeper, 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 deeper. The whole point is that it's supposed to percolate into your mind and sink in deeper and deeper giving rise to finer and finer layers of spiritual vibration shifts of consciousness and realization organ grinder matthias says it's called that sounds horrible so yes you're not a grinder machine, you know, not meat being made into minced meat, you know, it's like supposed to be make something in your mind blossom. And it's like you're, you're showering it with a sound so your mind can blossom and have beautiful experiences come out of it. So you choose the format most conducive to you in that moment to make that happen. So See, Asia has this culture of repetition ad nauseum, right? So they have this idea that, you know, you better repeat things one billion times over at least 15 years to gain any level of mastership. The American idea is I go take a weekend class Without exam at the end, I'll get a certificate and I'm the master at something, right? So um, we're having a big culture shock issue here also, right? The whole point is I've said, heard Lama say the reason why they tell people to recite things a 100,000 times is because Asians are lazy, you know? And a lot of these people that were practicing didn't have higher education, so they were doing a lot of mechanical repetitions. Um, but we are more like hyper and pushing too much and being too industrious and, you know, working it ourselves into burnout. And maybe this high speed repetition is going to just aggravate our minds. And maybe we should do more lesser repetitions. I remember, you know, doing retreats, mantra recitation retreats, right? And I was always so frustrated. I'd come out and the only th first thing and only thing people ever ask is like, how many mantras did you say? And I'm like, what about asking me what spiritual realization did you get? Like, what is actually more important, the number of the realization, you know? So I got very, very frustrated with that. I mean, it's like, you know, Sam, you're a dancer. It's like saying, like, how many plies did you do? And I'm like, ask me how graceful the performance was, you know? It's like, um, anyhow, so there's this. It, you know, like we already ran Christian practice into the ground by taking the soul out. Don't do that with Buddhism. It's not worth it because we don't have other religions flying around that you can run Buddhism into the ground and then just keep on switching. It's like, just be a good practitioner with high integrity, do a good job and make it alive and wonderful for your mind and just ignore everybody else and stupid comments of other people. Even if they are also Buddhist, in that moment, they do not qualify as Sangha. They're not community because they're not supportive sangha must mean those who 
lift you up, who support you, who 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 inspire you, who are ahead of you, who make you reach the next step, not those who drag you down and hold you back and put you down, you know? And then there's this inner circle phenomenon, the ones who make the inner circle about the guru so nobody can get close and push you out. That's not sangha, that's possessiveness, you know? So um, the refuge formula is there to be recited and make make it not fun, like fun, 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 you know, not this American superficial fun, but I should say enjoy it, you know, enjoy it. And um, there's a very wonderful haiku, which is a short form of Japanese poem in three lines. Um, and of course, a lot of it, it, it's very strongly coming out of Zen Buddhist culture. And um, there's one teaching poem, teaching the aspect of that you can ruin your Buddhist practice if you push too hard. And there's nothing truer. It's not truer for any aspect more than for mantra recitation or recitation of prayer formulas over and over again. The haiku is, okay, sorry, I have to step one step back. The highest mountain in Japan is the Fujiyama, which is an extremely high, you know, conical shape, um, very iconic volcano. And it's at least 9,000 feet high or something like that. So, the um, haiku goes, Oh snail, climb the Fujiyama. But slowly, slowly. Means don't rush up and forget to enjoy the way up. You know, take your time, look around, enjoy. So don't rush through the mantras, enjoy the ride, enjoy it while you're doing it. You know, most people do the practice also with repetitions, like stuffing down the chocolate cake so fast you don't even get to taste the taste. Don't do that. Uh, that's not really what the lamas are saying. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's my personal experience. So the reason why we're repeating things is also because it creates a vibration, a vibrational pattern and a harmony. So now I'm singing in a choir where, you know, the four voices, sometimes we're more five, six, whatever, sing calls, creating har harmonies that have vibrational patterns that create states of consciousness. So that's what you're trying to do. So don't rush over it, but sit there and create that. So the shift in consciousness can happen and you can be lifted up. So um, the way you practice is that you have a rosary, which I don't, that was dumb, or you don't, but traditionally you would have a rosary and you will say with each bead, the formula Namu. And usually when you do it as a practice, you do the four fold one, Namu Guru Bye, Namu Buddha Ya, Namu Dharma Ya, Namu Sangha Ya, next bead. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddha Ya, Namo Dharma Ya, Namo Sangha Ya. Next beat. Namo Guru Bye. So it's for some reasons, it ends different on Guru than on the other ones. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddha Ya, Namo Dharma Ya, Namo Sangha Ya. Right? Whichever language you do. And the preliminary practice called refuge practice asks you to do that a hundred thousand times. So this recitation a hundred thousand times within the context of a prayer. So we'll do that. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
So I'll go to the topic now of so-called preliminary practices. So in mystical Buddhism, you do certain practices to render you suitable. It's like the warm up for serious practice. And they are called the preliminary practices. So there are different traditions you can do like traditional three or eight or even more or whatever. There are different practices. And then within some of you are Keluk tradition, there are even then scholarly practice, sorry, scholarly studies such as logic and stuff can be counted as preliminary practices. Those are practices we do that are defined as virtuous. That means good karma. And it creates a huge amount of good karma, which means it is the same as accumulating millions of dollars in your account of good energy that will boost and support you for the rest of this and future lives. And um, the very first of the preliminary practices is taking refuge. It has to be because it's the first step for any higher practice, no matter what you're doing afterwards. Also, in terms of esoteric Buddhism, the first step is always refuge. And if that's just a word, in your mind, a word with an R, an E, an F, a U, a G, and an E, it is just shambles. It's just a scam. It's just fake. It's just, it's just nothing. I was just outside raking dead leaves. It's like a dead leaves. You know, you touch it, it just goes, there's just not, nothing to it. So again, it's, it's, it's like your entrance ticket. You're showing to your own mind and to enlightened beings saying like, I'm actually serious. I'm actually even a Buddhist and the practice, whatever it is that I'm about to do has any validity to it at all. And the reason why you do it as a preliminary where you're re repeating it a hundred thousand times is so it can go deep. So you spend hours so it becomes a really profound realization that you can call on in that moment. So it's similar to a seminal experience actors call upon when they're supposed to start crying in that moment in their role, right? So that when out of nowhere somebody says, oh, let's pray, and you start like saying, I go for refuge, that it's not just like blah, 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 blah. But actually in that moment, you can call up that emotion, that experience, the memory of this huge, juicy, deep, complex, rich experience of the meaning of what it means to you to go for refuge. You can be switching yourself into the mode of like, I am in a state of refuge right now. Because ultimately, you're supposed to never fall out of refuge, you're supposed to switch yourself into a state, your mind into a state of being in refuge for the rest of your life and lives. If you manage to do that, don't worry about the bardo, there cannot be a safer ride. If you can arise in the bardo or even remember taking refuge, you'll be safe, you know? So um, I promise you that I'm going to be explaining to you how all these topics fit together. They fit together. They're one. So um, in reality, you don't do a repetition of 100,000. It's defined as 100,000 plus 10%, including 10% of the 10%. So in reality, you have to actually do a count of 111,111. And that takes a while. Even if you do a retreat, it depends on how fast a reciter you are. I just advertised against trying to be fast. Uh, it can be two, three weeks full time. 
right? That's fine. Imagine, I mean, isn't there anything better in your whole life than to say, I'm spending three weeks shifting my mind into a state of consciousness where I'm safe. I mean, Mindy, you and I, we're psychotherapists. Wouldn't it be great if all of our clients did that, you know, out of the state of being traumatized into, wow, it's like even five minutes a day. That would be amazing. So, um, you know, and Catherine, you're working for the United Nations. Just imagine like every single of these war-torn nations you hear about, like the whole nation, take five minutes a day to feel safe. It would be amazing. It would change the whole planet. So that's outside of our control, but we can control our own mind and we can do it. Um, <clears throat> so you say... And I mean, you can do something similar or parallel for, ever, for whatever spiritual system you are in, right? So like, for instance, I'm not Catholic, I'm not born and raised Catholic, but they do like the Hail Marys or in the Orthodox Eastern Church. Um, they do this constant repetition of certain prayers to create a vibration that transports them into a different state of mind as well. So you do that repetition inside of the context of a short visualization and you have to mark the repetition. So every time you finish a rosary, so you have 108 be beads on a Buddhist rosary, you can mark one and then you do the math, how many rosaries you have to do to get to 111,111, 111, right? So you literally have to make a list, you know, and you'll be slower in the beginning and you'll slowly get faster as you go deeper and it becomes more of a sound and a vibration exercise. What you do is you take refuge by saying those words in that meaning and you do that while visualizing the historical Buddha. The historical Buddha is here like the archetype of an outer image given to a state of enlightened mind. So the historical golden Buddha, the way he's sitting there, cross-legged in one hand, and holding his begging bowl with the other hand in the earth touching mudra. And you imagine him in front of you at the height of your forehead, um, you know, about, they say, a cubit high, about this high, um, in the air, made out of light and radiating light towards you. That's not so important right now, but it's like a radiant appearance. And so you're starting to work with this idea that you're facing something and this something is a holy image. It's an image of enlightenment. And so you say, I go for refuge to the guru. Then that has to have some meaning for you. So who is your guru? What is your guru? Are you going to mean a certain human being or a bigger principle? Are you going to shift between the two? But anyhow, you say, I go for refuge to the guru, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And then you can recite the typical uh, prayers you do, which is the prayer for... So I go for um, Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. And then you're saying like, and I'll be doing this for the sake of all sentient beings, the, the refuge bodhicitta prayer. And then you start with a repetition. So you're, you're basically saying, I'm here for altruistic motives. 
I'm going to do that for everybody else as well. And if you want to increase the merit, then you envision that everybody else, every single living being in human form is with you. They're all sitting behind you and you are leading them like the chant leader in the prayer. They're all praying along with you. That means you've multiplied your merit by however many you visualize because suddenly it's not one person saying it. It's if you can visualize 100 people with you, then 100 people are reciting it, right? And if you can imagine all of humanity and all animals and maybe all ghosts and whatever, then it becomes an ocean and then the merit you're creating, the good karma becomes an ocean every time. And what, what you do, see now there's going to be many different points to your practice. And of course you can't do it all at once. That's very, very advanced state of concentration. But you move between those. You say like, in your mind it's like Shakyamuni. Okay, I remember he's golden, light. People behind me, it's supposed to be that the right side is the male archetypal male. So male beings behind my right female beings behind my left, me sitting there, and then I go back to remembering the meaning of what I'm saying, then Chakyamuni Buddha, everybody with me, you know. So you move between those. So it's um, a kind of a, I mean, I want to say you're moving between different things you're concentrating on, but you're not supposed to think of it like that. Like, for instance, if you perform a piece of dance or you sing a certain song, it's not because you're on the 15th bar that you're suddenly in a different song than when you were singing the first two or three bars. So they ask you to consider it all as one, Shakyamuni Buddha in front, everybody in the back, and the sound, the words you're saying, and the meaning is all, it's one oneness, but you are shifting your concentration, your focus between the different parts of that thing that is one. Maybe a different way of giving an analogy would be like going to the Louvre and looking at the Mona Lisa, you know, and then you look at her hair, you still, it's the same painting than if you look at her fingernails or at her smile, right? So, but you're shifting, but it's one object. And so as you're starting the mantra recitation, you imagine golden light coming from, sorry, white light coming from Shakyamuni Buddha towards you. And the white light has the meaning and carries the energy of purifying like washing you you know whatever makes you feel sad narrow um makes you feel like you're inferior anything you feel guilty for that you feel you did wrong anything you want to purify in your karma it gets dissolved and washed away by this white light until you yourself start to brighten up. You know, you also become more white and more radiant in appearance. And if you really do this on a regular basis, like once a day or in a retreat setting, that will have an accumulative effect and really change also the way of how you feel about yourself and how you see yourself. And you do that and... You, after a while, a few sessions, you figure out how long you want to do it, you know, and over time you build up stamina and you can do it more long, longer. Um, so let's say you say, I'll be reciting the refuge formula for 15 minutes. So you can say for about half of that or 10 minutes, I'll be purifying. And then it's like, I've washed 
myself, the vessel, the cup that's receiving. And now I'm receiving golden light, which represents wisdom, the wisdom of enlightenment. So you change nothing with your pulling the beads. You change nothing about the recitation of the formula. But now Shakyamuni Buddha is sending golden light and you are completely filled with golden light and you you meditate on this. Before that, you meditated like, okay, I'm being washed, I'm being purified. And then ultimately, like now I'm totally pure. You're affirming that in your mind. And now it's like you're feeling like I'm being filled with wisdom. And at the end, you're affirming, you're saying, now I'm filled with wisdom, right? And um, then you finish. You've hopefully noted down how many malas you did how many full rounds well, you did, and then you dedicate the merit. So dedicating the merit is like hitting save on your computer. Nowadays, we have autosave. We're all old enough to remember times before autosave and how bad it was to lose everything. And that's a great analogy for what happens if you don't put you the good karma you just created in a safe spot. It's like just having created it and you hit the wrong key and everything is lost. Hitting the wrong key is getting angry once or something like that and screaming and having a nasty thought and wishing something bad for somebody, you know? And a lot of people, I mean, I just cannot believe how many Buddhists walk around and literally say things like, I, I wish my parent was dead. And I'm like, eh, do you understand at all what it's supposed to mean to be a Buddhist? It's like your parents gave you your life. That's a pretty big generosity for this lifetime. And they may be a pain, but don't wish them dead. You know, that's kind of the wrong approach to things. So don't wish your parents dead. Just wish for them to stop being bothersome. So, um, so we dedicate at the end, das heißt Widmung auf Deutsch. So we say, I dedicate the merit that I just created. And then it's like putting it into a bank account that you can't touch for a very long time at a high interest rate, right? So you say, I dedicate this merit towards my enlightenment. That means that account can't be touched, that amount can't be touched until you've actually reached enlightenment. But like all good investments done at a good interest rate, all along it will give you interest. And you know how smart people who have a lot of money tucked away in funds, they can live off of the interest. So the whole point of being a Dharma practitioner is that you create enough merit that you dedicate towards your and all other sentient beings enlightenment that the continuous stream of karma ripening from that is enough for you to live off of until you actually do get enlightened. So, and then you can finish the session. And that is the most basic practice. And there are certain schools of Buddhism, namely the Kagyu tradition. It's like the moment you walk into the center, I mean, nothing else can happen until you've done that. It's like, okay, you do refuge preliminary, period. It's like your fall, you go to kindergarten, period. You get to kindergarten, it's like, this is your cubby, you hang your jacket there, your house shoes are there, you know? It's like, first things first. And now it's like, it's increasingly unpopular to bother with these basic things and people jump to the highest initiations instead. And this is a degenerate aspect of Tibetan Buddhist practice um, that creates the most glitz and the most income for the Tibetan Lamas. 
So those are very glitzy events. Um, the spiritual benefit to your own mind and your own enlightenment is not very great. However, the very unattractive, stupid thing of sitting on your cushion and reciting the refuge for so many times will change your mind and you'll walk out a different person. You can never mutate back. And people just don't want that. They'd rather go glitz, glamour event hopping in the Dharma scene, you know? So this is my sales pitch for actually doing refuge practice. I'm a complete flop. As of now, I just checked with Jimpa Jimpa and I have failed to inspire even one single person to do it because it's so unpopular because it's only the most basic thing to do. So um, I loved it. When I did mine, it's like, I don't know, like 30 years ago, I cried when I had finished my account. I'm like, I don't get to do this anymore now. It feels so good. It really feels good. It's like, just try, if you seriously try it, it's also like people are like, oh, be there, done that. I already finished that. I'm like, something must have gone wrong. Any of these basic practices, if you do them with heart and deeply, you should feel at the end, this is my max, you know, my, I'm making the statement now, you should feel at the end like you never ever want to stop because it's so nice, you know? It's like going into the nicest jacuzzi at the perfect temperature. But you're creating that jacuzzi with your own mind. You know, it's like you don't want to get back out. It's so nice. So if you didn't don't feel like that, there's a mistake because you didn't create that jacuzzi to be so nice and attractive. So go back and make a nicer jacuzzi. <laughs> so um that's my big sales pitch about refuge. Um, and that is the answer to where were you, God, when I was really down and out? And like the story is like, well, you only saw two footprints in the sand because I was carrying you. That thing that carries you in that moment, that's the strength of your refuge. So it's up to you to create that or not. So it holds you in those moments when you think you're destroyed and you can't go on. And that is why you're supposed to do it first thing. Not because it's inferior, because it's the best. And you can also think about like, what is it in life that you're taking refuge to, you know? And I did a very deep retreat about that once. And it's like, here's my confession. I take refuge to my bed, you know? I think it's super cool to lie down on a soft mattress to sleep at night. And this is the one thing I have a very tough time giving up in this life. You know, I really don't want to sleep on the floor. While I was in India, I slept on rock hard mattresses for three years. And my shoulders are still ruined. You know, it's like, um, ask yourself, what is it? What is it that's so attractive in this life that you are sticking to it? And for me, it's my mattress, you know, so ask yourself that. So you can start to have a dialogue over the jacuzzi and the mattress. So Good. I was thinking we should um, close today by doing the refuge um, meditation once. And if you're not a Buddhist, it doesn't matter because you can think of the universal principle. And I like to think of it as the universal principle of enlightenment means making your mind wider and more spiritual and more enlightened in a non-confessional way going for refuge to the guru would just be any anything that serves as a spiritual teacher or teaching event in that moment. Going refuge to ultimate truth doesn't hurt anybody. And going for refuge to people who are on the right path, who are virtuous, 
also doesn't really hurt anybody. So um, we'll do it in that spirit. So if you can um, try to sit as meditation like as possible, the short is that your spine is straight, that you're not slumping. And if you can, that your hands are, you know, like this in your lap. Um, That's all another thing is like meditation posture, but um, if it makes you sleepy, don't close your eyes all the way, but keep them slightly open. Feel the weight of your body under your behind. And feel your breath. And let go of everything else on your mind and in your thoughts. And think that as you're looking ahead, there's a beautiful, radiant, vibrant, golden, light-emitting image of Shakyamuni Buddha fashioned out of light floating in the air. He's alive. It's not dead like an image. He's looking at you with smiling eyes. He's very fond, very fond of you, very happy to see you there and to see that you even have a thought of doing something good. And in your mind, you can also say it out loud. You, you think to yourself, I go for refuge to the teacher. I go for refuge to the enlightened mind. I go to refuge to all that is ultimately true. I go to refuge to all those who are on a true spiritual path. And I'm doing that in order to become enlightened myself so I can help all other living beings reach that same enlightened state. And as you're mentioning these other beings, feel that they are there, present, behind you, all around you. The male beings in human form to your right and the female beings in human form to your left. And whoever is sick or in whatever way impaired, you visualize even horses, everybody as humans who are young, healthy, complete, and perfect. You, so you don't think that the gangsters there are carrying guns and having negative thoughts. Everybody is perfect in your visualization. And you're inviting them to join in with you while you're reciting. So... Now you're reciting in your mind like in like a stream. It's like a little brook that is making these nice, agreeable water sounds as it cascades over the stones in the mountains. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmanaya, Namo Sangaya. And feel the golden light coming towards you, sorry, the white light coming towards you, washing away all that is negative, scary, 
dark, limiting. Namo Gurubye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmanaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Gurubye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Gurubye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. And the white light starts to completely fill your body. And it also washes over all the other beings, making them pure and filled with light. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. And you're affirming, I'm doing it fast here. I'm completely purified now. Everything inside of myself feels white and radiant and clean. And now the golden wisdom light comes. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. And your entire body and mind is filled with golden radiant light. And it's also washing over everybody else. So now's our chance to visualize every single human being and creature as filled with ultimate wisdom. So let's really do that. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Bye, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya. Dharmaya Namo Sangaya. And everybody is completely blessed and filled with ultimate wisdom. And we would do that for a long time, but we're coming to a stop now. And you think that this beautiful energy that we have all created together here in this online group. Everybody we visualize joining all of that positive energy karma that feels like this tremendous amount of vibrant light. We dedicate it. That means we put it into our safe account of good karma. We dedicate it towards our future enlightenment. May we all become enlightened as quickly as possible in order to help benefit and lead to enlightenment all those other sentient beings we've been visualizing and even all those we didn't manage to visualize. And now you seal it further by rejoicing. Spend a moment to feel really happy about it and rejoice saying, that was really good. I'm really happy I did that. And that was an introduction to the um, refuge practice. So I don't know if you've ever received an oral transmission of the refuge formula mantra. Um, which you're supposed to get from a llama, but it's so unpopular. So if you want, we, those of you who want, you can stay on a little bit longer. And you're not supposed to ever say what you practice or brag with it. But sometimes in moments like that, you say it, it's like showing your driver's license, like saying, yes, I can drive this bus with 20 people. So um, I have done the refuge practice and I have done that amount of mantras actually even more. So I technically qualify as a person to give the oral transmission of that mantra because I did so many, if you do so many repetitions, it's thought that it strengthens the blessing of the sound if you give it to somebody else. So that's the idea behind it. 
And yeah, so I just hope that this was um, inspiring to you and that it will help you to not feel bad next time you feel like you're a refugee um, or like somebody on the run from bandits and that you'll catch yourself in a strange part or running away from samsara and suffering, running towards something better that you'll say, oh yeah, right. She said, that's what refuge means. I'm a refugee right now. I'm doing it right. I'm supposed to feel like I don't belong anywhere. That means I'm running for virtue and it's a good thing. It doesn't mean I'm lost. It means I'm found. I found myself and just flop your mind back into the state of remembering refuge and you'll be saved like this that's your security protection system so that's my sales pitch and i hope you enjoyed it and it can be useful even if you're not a buddhist Michelle, do you have a question? I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious how important is it to speak out loud the mantra versus saying it silently? I tend to go a little bit more silent with my mantra. Mm -hmm. So uh, doing refuge preliminary is um, part of the technically speaking. The technical answer is technically speaking, it's part of the so-called open teachings where all recitation happens out loud. That doesn't mean loud, loud. Usually it's like you're mumbling it under your breath. But the version of doing it completely silent in your own mind is only part of some of the highest esoteric teachings. So the technical answer is you do it loud with a tiny sound under your breath. Um, if you are for other reasons practicing the silent practice because that you've been initiated into that, you can apply it also to this practice. Um, I have a second question too. If say we already, we have a practice where it includes refuge, but maybe I'm not, would it be easy enough to just elongate the refuge part of a daily meditation practice and just incorporate I, uh, people do things like that um it is um what why, why don't we do this afterwards when the open teaching people have logged out because otherwise i'll get stuck with the answer okay um, but basically this question doesn't technically arise because basically speaking, you do it first before you do all the other stuff. So this, that usually doesn't arise as an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Mindy? So um, this may be a question to to wait for a minute, but I'm mm -hmm. curious about when you're doing like a series of practices in one session, if you ever recommend doing dedication after each one or always sort of saving up to the end and doing dedication at the end, seems like it could go either way. Um, you can do it either way. It never helps to do lots of dedications in between. Like when you used to write your diploma thesis, you'd hit the save command all the time, like better not lose even half a paragraph, you know? So um, uh, I really like, especially for practices like this, I really like monoculture, not in agriculture, but in spiritual practice, yes. Because if you do a lot of practices that can serve its own purpose, but doing like total immersion into refuge, 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 in my personal experience leads to an experience of depth, of spiritual realization of that one point that is unequaled. There are very few people who have the kind of mind 
where it's counterproductive because they get bored so quickly that they don't go deep. Then only then is it useful to constantly change. I mean, um, if you can do a retreat and really set time aside to do it like total immersion, um, I guarantee you it is so delicious and y yummy. It's better, the best chocolate cake in the world. See, I've talked Michelle into doing some of these boring uh, preliminaries and she really loved them. And now she's like addicted. And that's the sign that you're doing it right. It sounds like so boring. You know, it's like, I think I had to do like 10 different preliminaries and I was like, oh my God, you know? And it's like, I got addicted to every single one of them because they were so nice. Once you get through the, and in the beginning, it's awkward. It's like, when you're starting a new choreography, especially like on a February morning when it's frosty outside, you know, and your joints crack and you're all creaky and it really doesn't flow. But it's a continuous repetition that will get you to the point where, you know, it's like some of you are artists. When things really work, then it's like you get into the zone and things just happen, you know. You have to reach that point with your practice, otherwise you're missing the point. And that comes from that repetition and the constant practice. So, um, yeah, other questions? No? Okay, good. Then, then we'll say, Oh, I wanted to say one last thing, which is that the FPMT has a very good online shop for Dharma practice material. I mean, I, I did this so many decades ago. At that point, you know, there were these banged up weird photocopies that were barely legible that I had when I did this. I'm sure they have a very fancy little booklet now that you can buy. If you go on there and you look under refuge preliminary, right? And they will have more prayers stuffed into there because that was Lama Subarambuchi's style was to do. I'm sure there's a seven limb prayer before and other things. So I did like the bare bone model now. So, but if you want to get like a nice little booklet with a cover that has Shakyamuni Buddha the way, so you can set it up like that. This is a Van Gogh, uh, this is a Van Gogh, not, not a Shakyamuni, but you know where you can just set it like that on your altar so that when you like, what am I supposed to visualize? Oh yeah, mm, I can open and close my eyes. This kind of thing, they, they are really, really great with that. And... Uh, uh, that's what I could recommend to you if you don't have a, a, a different source for that. Right? And um, yes, I think everybody has taken refuge. If you haven't taken refuge in a ceremony, you can ask Jimpa. He officially has been given the right to give refuge. So. Good. That's it for real. And um, I'll see you all next two weekends. So next weekend is sorry, I may confuse it, but I think next weekend is generosity and then Guru Devotion or is it the other way around? So these are the two most difficult topics in Buddhism because they are the most distorted and abused and used to exploit students. That's why I'm teaching them. It's not like to tell people to give a lot of donations. That's not the point. I mean, nobody needs, I mean, that would be the lecture that lasts one sentence. You know, it's like, it's really about the whole complexity of it all. So Michelle, you may not want to come because you've already heard me say this but um one time a lot of people asked me to teach and i agreed to and i agreed to this topic and michelle was the zoom hostess 
and she was the only person who came. Yes, it's that popular. This another one of these super basic topics that um, has a popularity of zero. So um, I think it's worth talking about it and listening about it. And I'll not talk about it the, the typical way because that has proven difficulty and is also under review even by some of the more enlightened lamas because a lot of things have gone wrong. So that's my sales pitch for that one. So we'll see. Good. So I will see you next Saturday then.